Welcome back. Our second panel will discuss the issue, how might the convergence of these developments with the technological and other factors identified in the first two colloquia drive changes in the future of intelligence beyond the individual effects of these factors. I am honored to present the members of our second panel, Jeffrey Baxter, who is an independent consultant, Miriam John, who is an independent consultant and a member of the ICSB, Ellen McCarthy, also an independent consultant, and Mac McKnight from Ginkgo Bioworks. Um, Skunk, would you like to lead off with your opening comments? Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Joe, to, to paraphrase Jim Hendricks. Hey, Joe, <laughs> how, are you, how are you doing? Um, yeah, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I'll just have said that, but I appreciate the opportunity. I'm amazed anybody cares what I have to say. So thank you for the opportunity to, to pontificate, emulate, and um, otherwise uh, be involved in the discussion. I'm going to talk about a couple of things. We're going to address the analyst and the analyst environment. And then at the end of, uh, of my presentation, we'll talk a little bit about China, as this is, seems to have become part of the discussion. Um, it was really interesting to me. Uh, some years ago, quite a few years ago, I gave a presentation at the, the GEOINT, the, uh, the Geospatial Intelligence Conference, um, <laughs> nominally uh, titled fighting from the crapper. Uh, the idea being that when you can't even get out of your driveway, uh, when there's such chaos that you can't get to the Pentagon or you can't get to Westfields or you can't get to wherever you have to be, you still have a duty to fulfill and you, you have a mission to uh, support. So how do you do that? Well, you're sitting there in your house and you have a BlackBerry or an iPhone or some communication device, how do you connect? Do you do it through the fiber optics of your cable? Do you do it through the copper for your telephone? Do you do it for the water pipes? I mean, exactly how are, uh, how are we going to function? And especially how is the analyst going to be able to function in a severely degraded environment? Um, I, I had, I, I, I guess the, they started to call me back. I got a number of phone calls saying, do you remember that talk that you gave about fighting from the crapper? Well, we're right in the middle of a COVID uh, epidemic, pandemic, and we can't go to work and we don't know how to connect and we don't know how to uh, operate in a classified environment um, sitting in our bathtub or sitting at our kitchen table or what do we do? So this brings me to a conversation that I'd had with uh, Robert Cardillo when Robert was over at DIA. Um, this is just when I had gone over to NGA. And he said, listen, I have uh, a, a, a cadre of analysts, all of whom are extremely talented, but they like to wear Hawaiian shirts and Donald Duck slippers. They consume cases of Oreos and Joke Cola, and they don't want to get up till two in the afternoon. Now, uh, that was an interesting uh, statement and, and an interesting request when he said, how do I incorporate them into the analytical uh, community? <clears throat> so we already have a dichotomy because punching in nine to five uh, yes, I've been a studio musician for years, and if you want me to go in at 8 o'clock in the morning and work on a Barbra Streisand album or do a movie soundtrack or do a jingle for, for Pepsi, then I can do that. I have the craft, and I can do it and call it up um, on, on time. But that's not really being creative. So how do you leverage the creative abilities of the analysts that you have by creating an environment for them that they can operate in at, 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 their, at their best? Um, so we came up with a couple of ideas. 
for instance, uh, a, a, a way to address both the need for decentralization, connectivity, and the ability to create an environment for the analyst to operate in uh, uh, at its best. For instance, what would what would it be like if uh, the intelligence community invested in hundreds, maybe even thousands, of small mobile homes and parked those in the driveways of every analyst that wanted to be able to operate at their own uh, pace and in their own timing? Uh, and when the balloon goes up, and when the it hits the fan, and nobody can get to work, the ability to be able to operate decentralized in a classified atmosphere, Tempest secured mobile home or, or, or some kind of um, portable skiff, if you want, uh, would do two things. It would give the analyst the opportunity to operate when there's a problem and when all else is you know, falling apart. And again, allow the analyst to operate in, in an environment that they feel comfortable in. And one of the things that Robert and I talked about is if you did that, one of the things that would happen would be like-minded analysts would begin to form working groups, ad, ad hoc working groups. And then what happens is that, uh, based on the creativity and the knowledge and the desire to connect up with fellow analysts, you would begin to create um, cadres of expertise. Um, the environment that we have now where you punch the clock from nine to five is the antithesis of that. We're killing the creativity of the analyst. And not only are we killing the creativity of the analyst, but we are overwhelming the analyst with so much data and not giving them the tools to um, take advantage of that, of that data. Um, Rob Zitz and I did a survey of all the analysts at NGA one year and the overwhelming opinion was, we just want to get our email to work. I mean, that's pretty scary when we're considering the adversaries that we're faced with and the responsibilities that the analyst has in the future. So uh, we get to the point where first we have to create an environment for the analyst. The next thing we have to do is we have to support the analyst. Now, throughout the history of mankind, a man has tried to enhance his ability to both operate physically and mentally, um, whether it's bodybuilding, whether it's drinking great amounts of, of mead uh, to go into battle, whether it was the Germans during World War II with Pervitin, which is basically an methamphetamine. Uh, the Allies did it with Benzedrine. We still do and search for uh, ways to enhance the capability of the human being. Uh, but let me just put forth an idea. Many years ago, when I was at the Air Force, Rap uh, Air Force uh, um, uh, Lab, uh, AFRL, at, NAS at uh, Wright Pat, uh, Dr. Jeff Bradshaw was working on a project called uh, Pilot's Assistant. The idea being that the day that a pilot went into flight school, there was a sort of an R2-D2 that accompanied him 24-7 and began to learn and understand the particular style, if you will, of the pilot's uh, capabilities as a, uh, as a fighter pilot. What would happen if you took that same concept and brought it over to the intelligence community and created analyst assistant? In other words, what if there was a, and for instance, in this conversation that we're having now, everything that I say, every question, every comment, each person's analyst assistant begins to reach out across the web, across all possible entities to gather, collate, and, and bring together information based on the topic at hand. Not only that, but to make this really work, to begin to, to analyze that data in the style of the particular analyst, in other words, personify the analyst capability using what we now refer to as artificial intelligence, massive computing, deep computing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, okay, so that sounds a little weird, right? How do you copy or how do you um, 
uh, siliconize or gallium arsenize someone's uh, style. Well, I went to Stanford University a number of years ago and someone played me a computer version of Charlie Parker, the great saxophonist. Now, was the performance a little dry? Yeah. But as a musician, I instantly recognized Charlie Parker's style. So I know that it is possible to emulate and create a capability to uh, form a basis to do analysis based on talent inherent in the individual. In other words, what if I have a problem? I would like to be able to push the Charlie, Charlie Allen button. I would like to be able to push um, the Keith Hall button. I would like to be able to punch the particular buttons and call in the expertise and the point of view and the specific understanding of a group of very talented analysts. That capability exists, I know it does, but I haven't seen any movement in that direction at all. We keep punching time cards. It's like Wiley Coyote and the Roadrunner after they go at each other for eight months, they punch out and then they go up to the restaurant across the street from Warner Brothers. This is not gonna work in the future. And if we think that we're gonna be able to deal with our adversaries and, and have an advantage right now, we're just barking up, barking up a, a, a tree, the wrong tree, uh, frankly. Um, I think it's time to start looking at augmenting the analyst capabilities. And this is gonna be not only technologically, but biologically, we're, gonna, we're starting to see, especially as some of the work I'm doing at the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, the convergence of, of biology, machines, human beings, and, and technology. This is the future. We already do it. Anyone who wears a hearing aid, anyone who has an insulin pump. I mean, we're already going down this road. We're now at the cusp of being able to, to in, incorporate and combine machines and human beings. Why not? We need to do this. Now, why would, why would we have an advantage over our adversary? Well, one of the great uh, tenets of being an American is that we are a cultural melting pot. So instead of a one single-minded uh, national point of view, which comes from say China or Russia, we have the points of view of a number of different cultures. Why are we not leveraging that? This is the one great advantage that we have. We can put that kind of multicultural analytical horsepower to work. And then if you can artificialize it, if I may coin a word, um, we will have an analytical advantage that no one else will have. Why aren't we doing that? Drives me a little nuts anyway. And then we're going to get to the point where there's going to be no war. There's going to be no physical war. If we, if our adversaries do this right, the whole country will wake up going, yeah, I agree with you. Digital entities by the billions uh, infiltrating it and invading the human brain. We've already seen what's happened with the Havana syndrome. We already know that there are people experimenting with the use of electronics, microwave technology, and the ability to influence human thinking. I mean, we're all drug, drug addicts, let's face it. Why are we drug addicts? It's because we use music, stimulation uh, on all levels to, to create certain brain cocktails of epinephrine, vasopressin, oxytocin, adrenaline, which then drive our emotions. If I can do that in a concert, it's no big deal to translate that, to weaponize that to an adversary to be able to change someone's mind, whether it's through perception management, perception engineering, <laughs> on a communications level, or whether it's being done physically, chemically, and biologically. We are at that point. It may sound crazy, but it's not. Um, and 
Again, why would we want to engage in physical combat? When overnight you could change somebody's mind. Uh, now, I did, very quickly, with the little bit of time I have left, I would like to address the idea, uh, the concept of China that was brought up. Um, the, it's very interesting to see the consequences of the imbalance in male and female uh, population in China. There's already been some talk about the government distributing uh, sex dolls to members of the Chinese male population who have no access to females. Uh, if, you, if you accept that as a possibility and also understand that the uh, tremendous amount of, of uh, R&D that's going into creating a cyborg, a, a robot that has all the capabilities, personalities, it's basically a human being, but as a machine, if you think about the possibilities of that, for instance, what would be the, what would be the consequences of a government controlling a cyborg that is your girlfriend? What would be the consequences? There's already um, uh, um, examples of Chinese men marrying their love dolls. Why? Because they're starting to become emotionally attached. My God, what happens if that, if the emotions, the software that drives that emotion is written by an authoritarian regime? Think about that one for a while. And if you want to go to war and you want to motivate 40 million males, I would say that's a, uh, that's an interesting possibility. I know I've done a number of war gaming. And when I talked about the possibility of using the Mattel dolls that uh, three and four star generals buy for their daughters as collectors, people looked at me like I was a little bit nuts, but Germany then went ahead and banned those dolls. So obviously somebody is thinking about this. We are moving into a world that is so different, so completely different than anything that we have been able to understand I would say that the only people that really will be able to help us uh, predict the future are going to be the people that have always done it. The science fiction writers, the, the, the movie writers, the script writers, the people that are thinking about the possibilities based on their understanding of knowledge today and being able to extrapolate that. We need to do that with our analysts. John Boyd, a man who I have tremendous respect for, who came up with the concept of destruction and creation and analysts analysis and synthesis, to be able to break problems down and come up with a, syn a, a synthesis of a new, uh, uh, a new result based on using uh, uh, analytics that would take you to a different place. We can do that with machines, but we are, we're talking about being able to respond to an, our adversaries' decision-making cycles in nanoseconds. Human beings are limited in the ability of their neurons to be able to fire at a particular time, a particular capability. If we augment that with machines, if we create analyst assistants that communicate with each other, the power of that, the orders of magnitude of the ability of the analyst to be able to do his or her, her job uh, will be enhanced beyond belief. And it is the only way that we're gonna be able to, um, to prosecute intelligence-driven offense in a war fighting scenario. Anyway. Skunk, I, this is great and, it, and a good, good transition point. And I wanna make sure we get um, some time uh, for some of the other speakers, but I wanna come back to several of the points you just made as we get into the, uh, to the Q and A in a little bit. That was, thank you. I think going in uh, alphabetical order, I think uh, uh, Miriam, Mim, do you mind going? Um, sure, um, but darn you all for putting me after skunk. I mean, <laughs> how am I gonna, <laughs> gonna, gonna top that kind of creativity and, and, and also I'm not gonna even try. Um, You're way too kind. Yeah, uh, no, that was, that was pretty intriguing skunk and I would love to go offline and talk about a lot of these things. 
Um, I just want to preface my remarks by saying that, you know, 25 years on the Defense Science Board can, can um, warp your mind. And so um, uh, most of what I'm going to say reflects uh, the thinking that we have collectively done over that time period um, around change in the national security environment and change that was needed to, to address those changes. Um, when we had the topic of, of convergence presented to us on the panel and, and our little pre-meeting, the one thing that, that I kept coming back to is the fact that um, all of these factors that we've been talking about so far this morning uh, leads me to one thing. We are entering um, an era of national security in which uh, being surprised is a condition of national security. It's not an episodic kind of thing. Um, and and, and all. we've talked about some of the factors um, already this morning, but uh, let, let me do um, a, a little bit of a review and some of the, the, the sort of, um, if you will, a mini net assessment of where I think uh, uh, this surprise is gonna, um, gonna start to manifest itself. Um, we've already talked about, William brought up the multipolarity um, environment that we're in. Uh, we haven't used the word nuclear yet, but we are in a tripolar nuclear peer world. And uh, if you thought the deterrence was complicated in a bipolar world, start trying to get your head around the tripolar um, uh, situation. Um, and then um, uh, uh, bring in all of the other capabilities uh, that both we and our adversaries are, are developing competitively. Um, we've already talked about the, the Chinese and Russian military doctrine that, that embraces all forms of war, warfare and uh, their growing prowess in the gray zone and uh, hybrid warfare areas. Um, but, um, but on the other side of the coin, we hadn't quite gotten there yet because we still seem to be slave to this linear um, uh, way of thinking in the five phase approach. Uh, and what some people have, have termed, um, we think about escalation ladders, they think about escalation lattices. Um, that give them a lot more flexibility in what they employ when and can keep their thresholds down if they're, um, as they're demonstrating, they're so agile and moving from one uh, type of, of engagement to another. Um, both Russia and China are, you know, um, highly experienced in, in uh, disinformation and man manipulation campaigns, uh, and they have been uh, very quick to adopt new techniques in those, um, those activities, including uh, what we've already recognized as uh, using the vast amounts of uh, openly available information so that they can identify new vulnerabilities, um, but increasingly um, uh, getting smarter about how to target their messaging and influence to specific groups and even specific individuals. Uh, let's see, um, on the other side of the coin, who among us has had experience in dealing with anything like this? You might say, well, there's a few of us old dinosaurs left who lived through the Cold War, but even that doesn't offer um, many lessons to be learned because there's significant differences. We've already said it's not your, not your mother's uh, old Soviet Union in Russia today, but um, China presents an interesting case because of uh, the fact that we're, you know, in some level um, uh, uh, interdependent with each other for um, our, um, uh, our well-being. And uh, we share systems uh, either on the global economic regime or in the supply chain regime, all of those kinds of things that make moves and counter moves that much more complicated and uh, opening up the possibilities for unintended consequences. Um, <clears throat> we've all talked about worrying about losing our technical technological um, edge, uh, and in, on the subject of surprise, um, I think we are continually surprised at how quickly uh, the Chinese have progressed. Um, um, part of that from intellectual property theft, but in part because of their huge investments in S and T, that um, uh, numbers-wise are starting to equal or, or dwarf what we do. 
uh, and they're doing it in 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 the 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 very areas that that skunk just highlighted uh, that are going to give them um, uh, uh, potentially much more disruptive opportunities in AI, uh, neurosciences, biotechnology, quantum computing, and the like. Um, on the other side of the coin, looking at us, as Elsa has pointed out, we have a relatively immature understanding of, of China um, uh, across the board, uh, their culture, their values, uh, let alone uh, uh, their, um, their doctrinal um, uh, uh, goals and objectives. Um, and if you go back to the Cold War, this is one place where we can look for a valuable lesson. We took, you know, we spent a lot of money uh, developing cadres of Sovietologists uh, who um, didn't always get it right, but sure helped decision makers uh, make the right decisions many times over. Uh, we just don't have that in the Chinese realm. And I would say that, that we shouldn't be worried about access. We didn't have access to the Soviet Union either, uh, but we managed to develop um, you know, a fairly robust uh, intellectual base from which we could uh, inform our activities and, and, and the like. Uh, well, the sky is not totally falling because um, again, those of us uh, who um, grew up at least toward the end of the Cold War remember that um, we had our mojo going in the 80s uh, and, and we really paid attention to how we could inflict surprise, not just be victimized by it. And, and it was, um, it started with leadership at the top that uh, understood um, the vulnerabilities of, of our adversary and took advantage of that. We need to get back to that, um, that sort of mindset. Um, and that leads me to thinking about what's the role of the intelligence community in this context? Because with all these things come to, coming together, we've talked about, uh, in my view, a lot of what, um, what I would term as how to do it, but what is it that we really want the intelligence community to do? And I, I go back to basics when I have a tough question like this and say, all right, what is it we want to do? How are we going to do it? Uh, and if we just look at the, the first couple of what's um, uh, we want the intelligence community to do, uh, I think that, that um, we end up not far from what we've always asked of the intelligence community. Um, well, one is just a fundamental understanding of who can harm us and how they can, you know, and, and what are their capabilities for doing so. So the, the, the things that we, you know, we spent a lot of, of, of um, time and treasure on with understanding um, uh, capabilities, uh, concepts and capacities of a whole host today of adversaries. It's a little more difficult than it was, you know, uh, as we bifurcated uh, in the Cold War, focus on Russia, but we had a lot of other things going on. In the early days of the Cold War, there was a communist behind every block, every rock too. So we had a lot, a, a lot of activity uh, worrying about things that, that, that maybe we shouldn't have been, but we were. Uh, I would say that we're sort of at, at that sort of early stage in this new environment um, as well. But a second what that I would, I would say is a little more uh, nuanced, and we used to do that to, a, to a, a certain degree, but I think we've let it lapse in the counterterrorism fight because the counterterrorism fight has been much more um, tactical in nature. Um, and, and, and that's really to um, uh, understand trends. We've, we've talked about this earlier, understanding you know, trends and, and, and all, uh, understanding um, uh, some of the things that are obviously very accessible from the open, um, uh, open sources that we can, we can tap into, but also um, uh, what about the things what do they mean and, 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 and what about the things that 
we wish we knew, but we couldn't, because some things are going to be hidden and and uh, and much more difficult to get at. Uh, even more difficult is to understand the motivations and intent of leadership, uh, and we've let let a lot of those uh, kinds of of uh, uh, analytical capabilities atrophy, uh, as well as understanding um, at a societal level what are the the, the fundamentals of, of our adversaries and what does that introduce in the way of vulnerabilities. Again, these, these aren't new things for the, for, um, for, the, for the IC, but there are now many more actors that we've got to pay attention to. And we've talked about a number of ways in which uh, we might want to uh, do that. Um, and as such, that leads me to some of the, the hows. Uh, we've already talked about a lot of these, but I'm going to highlight one in particular. But just reviewing some of the things that we've already said today, uh, Skunk talked about the environment for analysts and uh, the, um, if you will, their buddies that could be uh, developed uh, to help them. Um, uh, we've talked about different ways of doing business, for example, outsourcing uh, some of the open source uh, analytical capability. Um, we've even talked about the need for potentially um, uh, reorganizations uh, in order to better um, to better um, do this, but there's there's one thing that that uh, I want to highlight because it's something that uh, it, it goes back to what I said earlier about um, uh, understanding um, the country's leadership and what motivates them, and that's namely what I would call strategic intelligence. Uh, and we need that for both uh, China and Russia uh, in, in, in particular. Um, we'd like to understand, we should understand um, what the leader networks are, both political and military, um, how they make decisions. Uh, we'd like to understand the R&D enterprises. Um, what are they making visible? What are they hiding? Um, the Chinese and the Russians are increasingly cooperating. What does that mean? And is there a wedge we could drive uh, uh, between that? Because they don't have a long history of, of loving each other. Uh, and equally important, we need to understand the consequences of any actions we take. And who better than the intelligence community if they understand um, these, um, these adversaries uh, as well as we'd like. Uh, what better source in the intelligence community to inform leaders about the consequences of the decisions that, that we might take? Um, it, seems, it seems to me that, that um, if you developed uh, these sorts of capabilities, the intelligence community is even in a position to now be a red teamer, if you will, of the fundamental assumptions of any sort of national security strategy that we, we, uh, we choose to sign up for. Uh, bottom line, um, we're in an era in which this convergence of so many different things happening so fast inevitably will lead us to be surprised. Um, and, and rather than worry about that, and uh, try to get better at what we said is impossible, namely predicting the future, we should be um, preparing for that, becoming agile uh, on our feet to deal with that and, um, and then moving um, forward to create a few surprises of our own. And it all starts with good intelligence. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, Ellen? Thanks, Anthony, and thanks everybody for um, uh, including me in on this session. It's fascinating. Um, so there is absolutely no question that advancements in technology have and are going to actually have to dramatically reshape how the U.S. intelligence community safeguards the American people. Um, I've heard people describe the age we're in right now as the golden age of surveillance. And it was only a few years ago we were sitting here considering how the IC might be able to use voice activated household devices or how data from autonomous cars could be used to track bad guys or how wearable technology could be used by the military to get a sense of how, um, their, how the health of their targets, the vulnerabilities of their targets, or the movement of their targets. I mean, this was just a few years ago, and, and, and we're already doing this. 
I mean, clearly the opportunities are endless. I mean, you just have to listen to Skunk for five minutes to get a sense of the only thing that is limiting us is our imagination and sort of these, this, this, the other thing is this behemoth bureaucracy as to how the IC can um, enhance and, and, and its ability to detect and disrupt threats. I want to spend a couple of minutes, and I'm only going to keep to a couple of minutes, Anthony, because I know we're getting short on time and we want to get some questions. But I really want to review the challenges the IC is facing and analyzing all the data that all these devices together um, are going to provide the IC, uh, an IC that is already drowning in data. I'm purposely not going to talk about privacy and security. That doesn't mean that I don't think it's incredibly important. I mean, the reality is, is that I think we need a national dialogue on what privacy is. Um, but not going to not going to go there um, today. Um, so three things. The first thing we need a paradigm shift in strategic analysis. So I just left government. I was at INR, State Department's Intelligence and Research Bureau, and I'll say that they had some of the finest all source analysts in, in, in the community for my optic. What made them so good was their time on target. On average, they'll spend 17 years on a region or a function. Their prox proximity to the user, unlike most, I mean, unless you're operating at the tactical level, at INR, you're embedded pretty completely with the person who's using your intelligence. So they have this great, great connection, this ability to build relationships. Um, and I think most importantly is they love what they do. I mean, I mean, not to say that others in the community don't love what they do, but they're not as worried about where they're going to go as they are just in, in really, they love what they do. That's one reason that they stay. Um, but, you know, they called through information in 2021, much the way I did in 1988 as a, a submarine analyst at Olin I. We had colored pencils, we had scrolls, we would color in blocks, we had a little SIGINT, had a little human, had a little IMINT. And, and, and so, I mean, to, to quote Joe Garden, in, in the strategic analysis was an intimately scaled human endeavor, and it still is that way. I think we need to flip the paradigm. I mean, we need to st we need strategic analysts who are more interested in driving trends from huge amounts of data by coming up with those trends on their own. You know, at INR, I asked our analysts, we had developed a strategy and I asked them, what would be your perfect day in 2025? You know, we've got this strategy, we're making these investments. You know, what would your day look like? And one of the analysts in particular said, I'd like to wake up at nine in the morning, I'd like to walk my dog, I'd like to go work out, I'd like to come into work um, at a reasonable hour, turn on my computer and see a visual that showed me sort of all the things that I needed to dive into. I mean, I think that's exactly what we're talking about when we say a paradigm shift. And, and the, the frustrating part is, is that we can actually do that today. I mean, those tools, that technology exists today. It's, it's operating in the private sector. The second challenge I want to talk about is this the innovation sucking bureaucracy that exists in the national security sector and government right now. I mean, I wish I had a nickel for every time I've heard that we've got a technology problem. We don't have a technology problem. And if you look at what's going on in the private sector right now, and, and here I am, it's eye-watering the things that are going on in terms of innovation and, and capabilities. And it's not like when you're in government, you're just completely brain dead. I mean, you know that you, we need big data analytics and we need capabilities and we need people who understand how to work with the data. Everybody knows that. But um, but I just, we, I just wonder why, I mean, why is it that we're not bringing these things on? What What's the problem? And, you know, um, Anthony, I suspect you saw this when you were at NGA. I know, I know I did, but it's just so hard to integrate new capabilities and to phase out legacy systems. It's crazy hard. Like it doesn't make sense, but it really is. Um, I mean, I think the problems are, you know, you, how much risk are you willing to, um, to absorb? There's funding issues. There's just the social acceptance. There's the need for a new governance framework and the need to reward rapid. There's a whole lot of reasons why it's just so hard to take down the old and bring in the new. And then our acquisition model. We've done hundreds of studies. Um, Ma'am, you're on the Defense Science Board. I know the Defense, Defense Science Board has done a million studies on what's wrong with our acquisition structure. But very little changes. Um, our system still rewards obligation of funds and does not reward moving out on smart technologies, investments, and identifying capabilities that should come into the government and those that should remain in the private sector. Personnel, security, and culture. I mean, are we hiring the right people? How do we retain? I mean, we've, we've again, we've done tons of studies on, on the kinds of people we need to um, hire, how we need to train them, what's wrong with the security clearance process? Why is it we have a culture that is so afraid to change? 
Um, and the last issue I, I think is oversight. And I'm a true fan of oversight. I mean, we need oversight, but too much oversight can actually sort of suck again the life out of innovation. I mean, there is no innovation when every day you're responding to questions from the Hill as opposed to actually doing the things that you say you're gonna do. And finally, I think, and the third thing that I think is a, um, a gap or, or, or an issue we have with regard to how, um, how our analytic cadre is going to work with the vast amounts of data that the IC has to bring in um, in order to stay relevant is that, and, <clears throat> and Carmen, you know, you, you told me I should write about this and I keep, there's this little voice in my back of my head that says I should, but the reality is the IC is not as integrated with the decision makers as it should be. Again, going back to my time at INR, um, I had one senior, um, everybody said INR was great. My first three months, talked to everybody, customers, the secretary, under his assistants, INR is great. But it was actually one very brave senior foreign service officer who said, you're just not as integrated as you used to be. And this got me thinking, it's not just INR that's not as integrated as it used to be. I think, I mean, it's a lot of the IC is not as integrated as it used to be. And, and when you look at how we deliver our data, I mean, not only do, not, do we not analyze data in real time, but we don't deliver it in real time. And that certainly was the case, to, case at state. You know, we, give, we provide the secretary with the PDB or we talk to the assistants and the unders with um, either hard copy products or we email products. We would email products out to the embassies if we thought they were interested in it. I mean, it's not a great way to ensure that you are actually impacting policy. policy. Um, and, and what ended up happening was if, if those people didn't like what they read in the morning or what they saw or what they heard, they just went someplace else. And the reality was it was because the private sector has gotten so good at working with large amounts of data and identifying insights and pushing them out in real time. And what ended up happening was if the secretary didn't like what we had to say, you know, he had a lot of other resources he could go to to get the information that he needed or or, or others who would support the paradigm that was in, in their head. And so I spent an incredible amount of time at INR, as did my colleagues, sort of running down bad information. So you had, you had information that was supporting a policy. In other words, the intelligence was being politicized. It wasn't coming from the IC, it, it was coming from the private sector. And, and so this really sort of gets to you know, how, how much value is the IC providing if they're not sitting in the room, if they're not providing that data in, in a real time or, or actually being in a place where they can impact the policy? Or as Mim actually mentioned, red, red teaming it, talking about how that policy is actually working or, or not working. And so I th these are the three biggest challenges um, I, I think there are to where we are today. And certainly if we don't really fix some of these, this, this, these bureaucratic issues, which are not sexy, not fun, really hard, but critically important. I'm mean, think the value of the IC in, the, in, in, in 20 years is gonna come into question. I saw it just within my last two years at state. So Anthony, this is where I'm gonna stop. I think I saved you a couple minutes. That was great, thank you. Um, Matt? Yeah, great, thanks Anthony. Um, and thanks to everybody else for uh, some really interesting comments. I think maybe I will, uh, I'll probably take a little bit of a different approach. Um, uh, the big question here is one about knowing something about the strategic framework of what the future looks like, what the world's gonna look like, what's the world we are going to be operating in. Um, and I'll just posit a, one hypothesis that is kind of the, the world I live in today um, and this is kind of the basic principle that we are on the cusp of a uh, technology revolution around engineering biology. Um, so I work for a company, Ginkgo Bioworks. Uh, we are built as a company on this premise that uh, DNA is code. And if you can read that code via DNA sequencing and you can write that code in de novo sequences via DNA synthesis, if you can read and write code, then you can program. And the programming substrate are cells. Cells are manufacturing platforms on planet Earth, right? Cells uh, make plant cells or bacterial cells. Cells uh, are obviously all of us. Those cells run in digital code in the form of DNA. So if you think about that in a strategic context, there's the other part of uh, kind of things that people discussed uh, is our like ability to comprehend technological innovation and the pace of technological innovation. So I look back and, I, and I'm a history major. So uh, this is about the, the limit of my 
scientific knowledge, right? Uh, you look at the 20th century and you look at what defined economic output. It was physics and chemistry moving from bench science into engineerable disciplines. Chemistry and chemical engineering took the barrel of oil and made it everything around us to a first order approximation. Physics gave us airplanes, satellites, rockets, modern communications so that we are much more connected. They came together at the end of the century, material science, chemical engineering, plus electrical engineering physics to create the computer chip, to give us the digital tech revolution that gave us this massive information economy that we have today. And those two were really the story of economic output in the 20th century. GDP growth expanded dramatically over that, that hundred year period. There's one domain of high school science left that we haven't taken from bench science, which is what we've been doing essentially with biology for the last 40 years when we've made amazing drugs. That's a lot of learning, but a lot of like traditional experimentation or something that looks a lot more like traditional experimentation. We are now on the cusp be via this topic of convergence of computer science, engineering or robotics and AI of being able to turn biology, the reading and writing of DNA into cells, the programming of cells into an engineering discipline something that you can do with much more, uh, much more forethought and planning from a probability of success standpoint. So you can imagine the, the sheer power of that from an economic standpoint. I think that is the, for me personally, the defining feature of the next 50 years of our world. One of the most important and underspoken about trends will be our, the change of the things we can make and the efficiency with which we can make them via engineered biology, that last domain of high school science, making the transition from bench science into engineering discipline. So that obviously lays a very different strategic context, right? Um, I think we should be talking about globally, forget just the United States, globally, we should be talking about synthetic biology as a peer to AI, to quantum. That, th that is a, this is a uh, probably more impactful technology in the next 10, 15, 30, 50 years than even those. And so it has a, has a couple of pieces of implication for how you would organize a global security infrastructure, a national security infrastructure, how you might think about what we need to know about that world. First and foremost, it's a, the, the real operating question here isn't one of security, it's one of economic uh, development, one of economic security. The largest companies in the world, I would, I would be willing to uh, but significant amounts of uh, kind of time and energy on this topic. Personally, I'm also doing so. Uh, I'm biased on this fact because I'm working in the industry, right? Um, the largest companies in the world are going to be synthetic biology companies. They're going to, it's very much like the Googles and Apples of the world. Largest companies in the world are in the information economy. Biology disrupts the physical goods economy. You can think about all of human output, $100 trillion of GDP, and look at those supply chains and ask yourself, which one of them doesn't have biology in it somewhere? The answer is they all have biology in them. They just don't all have engineered biology in them. Engineered biology allows you to be incredibly efficient in supply chains and manufacturing processes. So we need to think about it from an economic growth and development standpoint, because economic power is national security, uh, as, we've, as we know from kind of uh, International Relations 101, right? So that's, that's first and foremost in my mind. Second are rules. The, the countries and companies and regions and groups of human beings and multilateral organizations that have the technological development capabilities and the technological capabilities of synthetic biology, of engineered biology, will get to set the rules. And guess what? Like, we have to care. We have to care how platforms in synthetic biology are used because. It is literally everything around us, all living things, right? And so there will be values judgments made. There will be ethical conversations that are, that are charged and difficult. And you, whoever you might be, want to be in a position to be at the table when those rules are made about how we use this stupendous power of biology. And we want to do so in a transparent, open, standards-oriented way. That hasn't really been a question with the information economy, with the internet, right? Because it came out of a open, generally open economy. Imagine if it had been flipped and it came out of it from, from, a, from a different type of governing system. That's, that's what's the game, the stakes of the uh, table for 
uh, synthetic biology. And then lastly, I think we have to think about this after COVID or during COVID. Um, there's going to be a public health reset after this pandemic, there, but there's also going to be a national security and uh, kind of uh, global security reset. Why? Because pandemic potential events are not getting less likely. Humans are encroaching upon lots of different parts of the earth. Uh, we, people that would seek to do ill to anybody uh, on planet earth are looking and seeing what the, dam the damage a small 29,000 base pair virus did to global economies. This is clearly, clearly a dangerous, uh, a dangerous piece of knowledge that exists because of the way we have all responded and shut down the global economy. So I think you have to think about that and you have to ask yourself, are we orienting our intelligence organizations, our global health and public, public health organizations, are we orienting around biology like an operational domain, one in which that we, we need to make sure stays focused on defensive capabilities that make pandemics too expensive and to make it makes them uh, ineffective? Or are we going to continue kind of approaching uh, biology, if you will, in kind of a a as a second order um, thing that the medical organization takes care of versus a uh, leading indicator of how the world's going to be organized. So I would just say, like from my standpoint, you had asked me the one truly framing characteristic of the coming uh, economic uh, reality of the world. It would be this emergence of engineered biology as the key driver of output, and then all of the things that flow from that. If you if you believe that outcome. That was great. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone. Look, too many, too many paths to go down. Uh, there are just so many um, interesting topics brought up by by each of you um, that we could probably have individual conferences on several of these topics. So, um, and we have about eight minutes left. So I'm going to be selfish and and ask uh, two two questions. Um, and try to get, bring us back to the, the core question of this particular panel, which was on convergence. And um, I'll ask that if, if you, I'll, anyone can respond, but please do so very, very quickly um, so that we can try to get through. Um, I wanna ask about convergence and two topics were brought up. Um, one was the golden age of surveillance that uh, Ellen brought up and the other is the importance of biotech. When those two things converge, how is that going to affect the IC and what can the IC do? And I'll, I'll, I'll throw that out and whoever wants to kind of come back quickly. Well, I'll just, I'll, I'll jump in very quickly. I think that the, you know, I'll leave the question of how does the IC react to the professionals? I would just say from my, from my standpoint, we need to think about uh, an investment in modern monitoring what is a, very, very significant threat, threat to humans in the same way we think about the levels of investment we put into things like uh, monitoring the weather, monitoring uh, whether missiles are launched from North Korea, right? Tens of billions of dollars a year just flying satellites around the planet, looking and watching and waiting. And to a first order approximation, our ability to monitor for uh, infectious disease, whether human made or natural, is about $50 million a year from what I can gather. Um, from a from a structural standpoint, that is a that is an information collection function. It is an intelligence community function, as far as I can read the read the way that this all works. Um, and that's that's something that you then can give to uh, to communities, to government, to policymakers to help them make better and smarter decisions. Uh, let me let me jump in and, and point out that you know we we started this in a big way uh, after the anthrax attacks, right after nine eleven. And, uh, and then let it fizzle, just like we did all things biodefense, um, just because nothing happened. Um, so to recognize, you know, the existential nature of the kind of things Matt's talking about and, and stay the course uh, is a huge challenge. And, and quite frankly, it doesn't, I don't think it costs the same amount of money that we invested in, you know, NTM, national technical means that we did in the Cold War. I think that there are plenty of other, you know, particularly through open source and particularly through, you know, global cooperative um, uh, health organizations that would let us get a handle on this. Over. 
You know, we're also coming into a world where the ability to collect on the individual is becoming a reality. Um, <clears throat> just by the use of smartphones, anyone, well, <laughs> the, the, the rise of the, uh, the Silicon Valley uh, companies making huge billions of dollars based on their ability to collect on the individual's personal information. Um, I, and this is not going to be a theological discussion. I'm just going to say I got to hand it to the Catholic Church for coming up to the with the most brilliant collection uh, strategy I've ever seen. Confession and last rites. The ability to talk to the individual from a, a organizational entity to be able to collect information on the private individual. We're now at the point where not only are we looking at smartphones to be able to collect, but we are going to be getting to the point as Matt I think um, helped illustrate for technology to be able to collect on the individual thoughts of every single human being on the planet. China is already doing everything that they can by creating a massive surveillance state to be able to collect and collate information on the individual. To me, that's going to be not only the greatest capability, but probably the greatest threat. And like I say, once you know how to do that, then the question is, how do you weaponize it? And once you weaponize it, like I say, whole nations will wake up one day going, you know what? You're right. We give up. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And, and Anthony, I'll just say one thing on this exact topic. This is my point about setting the rules around and being involved and sitting at the table around the ethical discussions that will be made uh, or will be had and the, the choices that will be made around what we do collect on and what we don't collect on. We, at least uh, as a company and as an individual human being, I care very deeply about the question of privacy around genetic material. Now, I will also say even more so for people to get a little bit uh, more exciting about this, like the actual interesting genetic diversity in the world is non-human. The interesting genetic diversity, the things that we protect ourselves from viruses or the amazing skin that changes color on a chameleon. Well, that's a cell coded with DNA with a program. So there's an amazing amount of creativity and things that are non-human. So I think we have an opportunity here to really have a smart conversation around what are the right choices to be made in our, in our new technology set around engineering biology. Yeah. You know, and, and Anthony, just to, I, I mean, just to throw in my two cents, I mean, I think the, the golden age of surveillance requires a golden age in analysis and dissemination, almost the golden age of the intelligence cycle. So we're going to have all this ability to bring in real time data, all sorts of real time data, like all kinds of data. But how is the IC poised to actually um, work with different sorts of data and push it, analyze it in real time, and then push it out in real time. And, and I don't think we're ready for that. Um, um, I know we're ready in pockets, but I think it gets to Mim's point about, you know, looking at our enterprise, you know, holistically. And um, I, I just don't see that yet. Yeah. Look, I could, um, I could keep up this conversation all afternoon. I think we're, we're just getting into the, to the good stuff. Um, but I am going to keep us on schedule and, um, I, I think we'll come back around to some of these, uh, issues that, that you all brought up in the, in the last session Q and a, but, uh, thank you so much, um, for all your thoughts. And I believe we have a break now for 15 minutes. <laughs>